Hello, welcome to Curve TV with me, Jack Farger, your host today. Um, we're trying a new format this week where each day we'll be hosting a different show, kind of linked to the things that we've done over the last couple of weeks. Um, and we're going to be starting off today with a uh, workshop about sustainability. Um, coming up in the rest of the week, we have a boot cap with someone who won our consultation challenge. Uh, we've got an interview with Curve founder Petra Barron, and we're going to do a lockdown lunch um, with one of our traders on Thursday. So make sure you keep an eye out and subscribe to us. You can also support all of our traders on curbfood.store, which is just here. Yeah, there it goes. Um, so on to today, um, we're going to be talking about sustainability, suppliers, in street food. And I guess that those are uh, two or three things that you might not think of that are that connected together. But um, it actually look below the surface and there are some really amazing things that traders and suppliers are doing in terms of sustainability and projects. So I'm going to introduce all of our guests for today, um, starting off with Lily from House Party steakhouse or you might know hey lily how are you hi yeah, i'm good how are you i'm good i like the little bit of greenery in the background yeah i just i just put that in actually just to like make the what's it called mise en scene like I yeah just wanted to, like, set the scene you know. it's lovely um cool thanks for joining us today and we're going to be talking <laughs> about um how you incorporate sustainability into your street yeah business. um so our second guest for today will also be um uh, as someone who works with suppliers and that's amelia from food chain um, hi, Amelia. Hey. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Great. So um, we're going to be talking to you today about um, what, why it's re a really interesting time to start thinking about the types of suppliers you could work with if you were setting up your own street food business and why, why, why those are really important to helping you stand out against the, against the crowd. Right? Okay. And then our last guest for today will be the amazing... Uh, one and only Hannah Walton from Curve <laughs> Seven Dials Market. How are you? What an intro! I'm good, thank you, Jack. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I, I've got such an amazing like group of speakers today. It's really, really cool to have you all here. Lucky you. Um, <laughs> it's lovely. We're going to be, <laughs> um, we're gonna be talking to Hannah about Seven Dials Market and the kind of sustainability projects that you can you can do in a twenty five thousand square foot space. Um, so uh, we also have Ollie as well, our co-host and producer, who's somewhere in the background controlling everything. Oh, hey, there you go. There he is. I'll go back. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Ollie. Um, so uh, mm. yeah, I think before we get started, like we were having conversations about how at the moment everyone is looking at their, not maybe not like so obviously at their footprint, but they're thinking about things in like a very different way. Like that Amazon Prime membership isn't as important anymore and the process and i i just i think it's really interesting that everyone's kind of picking up on that and having a, a deeper look into um into what they really need um yeah and, yeah so, um, i think for sure i think it's like people we it kind of a mass so quickly this like in demand i want it now this this and this so fast no one really had a moment to think about how it like got to that point, it just happened. And if you're like a businessman, you just understood it and just made it happen. But actually as a consumer, like we've never really looked inside the workings of a next day delivery business or like how we get flour on our shelves and stuff like that. So I think now obviously it's super sad and like tragic what's going on, but it, you have to look at the positives of sometimes these things and see like what we can learn from it. Yeah, cool. So I think that's, that's sorry, Hannah, what were you gonna say? Well, just that uh, we, like we, we, we were saying before, that um, suddenly it's been brought to your attention what it mean, you know, what it means to get something next day, and you know, actually having not being able to do that means that you're appreciating it when you do get it way more than you ever would have when it just sure. arrives. Day. You're suddenly connected to the process of how that's happened, and you know that that you you know you're becoming more grateful for those things. I think. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's interesting. Trends have shown that um, people have cared far more about recycling than normal. So when it comes to sustainability concerns, recycling has gone way up and then uh, other kind of things have gone down a bit. And I think it's because people are getting uh, food delivered to their home. They're caring about food waste and all the packaging that comes with deliveries. Yeah. 
So we're having this time to think and try to look at our behavior and see if we can do things a bit smarter and a bit um, safer. So, okay, great. That's really nice to have everyone together. So I'm going to start with Lily first. Um, so Lily, um, for yeah. those who don't know, you run Steakhouse. Um, I do. Um, can you tell us what that is? Yeah, of course. Uh, so Steakhouse is my street food business that I have with Curb. We do steak and chips, uh, basically. It's pretty simple. Um, and yeah, we've been doing that on markets, like festivals. We have a stall in Camden. And then there's like, it's called House Party Food now because there's like a few other like arms to it. But I think for today, like we'll talk about Steakhouse because it's obviously a big consumer of beef. Yeah. Um, and that's something that, you know, since the beginning is kind of like weighed on my mind because you obviously hear these statistics about like red meat and burgers or oh, it's like a, a year's worth of showers or something to make one burger and here I am selling like sometimes thousands of steaks at a time and I'm like oh my god like yeah. what impact am I having on the environment with just this one stool let alone like you know the millions of other steaks that are consumed yeah. around the world um and so yeah you... it's, it's interesting and when you when you so you started Steakhouse back in 2015, when yeah. and so you obviously you start trading and you start purchasing more and more and more meat. Yeah. Was it was it were any of your customers interested back then about sustainability? Uh, I mean, no, no. It obviously was not a thing. I think like early noughties and like definitely in the kind of two thousand like ones area I don't even know what that's called the tens I don't know Naughty, noughties no teenies yeah I don't know, the teenies. I don't know. It just like it wasn't a thing and uh, I mean we are um you know the produce of like what surrounds us and at the time sustainability like it wasn't relevant because climate change wasn't really relevant I, it was obviously but we didn't really care about it as much as we do now yeah. so obviously setting up this business like I just for me it was like oh god like how am I going to make money it wasn't really so much fo focused on the sustainability aspect which you know I'm not ashamed to admit because yeah. I feel like um, at the time I was just doing the best that I could and I think that's what everyone when they're looking to do a street food business should aim to do and then if you can like get these elements of sustainability in then you you should you know but at the end of the day there are millions of people out there who do not give a rat ass about any sustainability and they're just there like plowing on like it's hard isn't it to, yeah. to draw the line as to like where you should try and be sustainable and also where you should just try and look out for yourself because sustainability does at the moment come at a cost which is obviously a bit infuriating yeah and for a business to have impact it's got to be a business first exactly right? exactly and like if you're i think if you're starting up a street food business and you're nitpicking around all these little things you might actually never open because there's just so many bits and bobs that I didn't even figure out until they actually started going wrong live on site in the middle yeah. of a lunch service. So yeah, it's, 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 it, they do go hand in hand, but at the same time, like you've got to just get yourself going a bit first as sustainably as you can, I guess, but yeah. you are going to have definitely some unsustainable parts of your business to begin with, I think with street food. Cool. Um, so uh, what, when, um, where, where do you source your meat from today then? Um, so today I get my meat from the ethical butcher. Um, uh, well, it's kind of like their wholesale side of the business. Um, so you can like Google them. You'll see like that they are like a super sustainable kind of meat delivery service um, for like consumers. Um, but the guys there, I've worked really closely with them. We've actually done some stuff with Curb as well. Like we did a farm visit um, because they... For me, I have a, like I used to get my meat from HG Walter, who don't like don't get me wrong, they are also like a super sustainable um, wholesaler for me. Um, they really take care of their like farms and stuff. So, I, I I mean, for me, ethical butcher, I have more of a personal relationship now with the owners, and that's why I work with them. Um, <laughs> so, it, I, at the start for Steakhouse, it was HG Walter, and that actually I found by myself because. I was trying to find like good quality beef. Steak and chips is my product, right? I'm not going to yeah. go and get some like low quality steak because it forms half of my meal and I wanted to do well. I wanted yeah. to, you know, curb to think of me as a superior street food trader. So, uh, you know, but that was it. So maybe I was thinking about sustainability and things like that in the start, but it didn't yeah. 
come across that way because it was you're, more just you're about thinking, quality. You're thinking about quality, yeah. That's and yeah, that's really, yeah. And like less, you're with a product like steak and chips. That's you know, that's less is more. You know, it could yeah, totally. And like you know, there are elements of my service now like I get my blue roll and stuff from like Booker who are like a cash and carry thing and I don't know how sustainable they are but on the other flip side my main product I try and make sure that's as sustainable as possible so then I can yeah. like maybe drop a bit of slack in some of the other areas of my business where it might be harder to like get hold of sustainable blue roll I don't know yeah you, you, have to, you have to make an impact where you can I guess and exactly so and I think with the state being the main part of my product now. And it, I've learned so much now in the five years that Steakhouse has been open about sustainability. I would never now drop that side of the business yeah. for anything. Even if I was doing like a different event or a festival, like I'm, I'm not interested. I think that's super important now for me. So obviously, obviously you're not able to trade as you would normally, but you yeah. start, you've started working on a, on a new project that also incorporates yeah. those aspects. What, what can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, I was kind of working on it a little bit before this is kind of hand in hand with the ethical, uh, but uh, I'm getting my words confused ethical butcher <laughs> it is a burger business because we were calling it ethical burgers to start with but now it's called ground okay um we kind of saw a gap in the market here like obviously the burger thing i mentioned before gets a real bad rep beef does in general right but burgers get really bad rep in the press at, like i said that whole shower thing they're considered like one of the most unsustainable um beef products possible sorry i'm just throwing my toy for my dog he keeps annoying me <laughs> that's okay <laughs> so ground we kind of wanted to change the narrative on that because actually beef in this country it doesn't have to be bad for the environment at all i mean take for example now what's going on like there's actually still the same number of cows in the world and pollution and climate change has reduced dramatically and why is that oh it's not because of the cows it's because of all the other stuff that we do in this planet yeah exactly that has now reduced you know beef can exist in this world I and mean, it can be sustainable we just have such misinformed press and like misinformed way and also we're so used to having this beef that's like racks of supermarket beef like every single day of the week every kind of cut that you want that mass produced beef is obviously not sustainable but yeah you know beef farmers have existed on on this uh fair land for quite a few years and i hope that you know we can change people's idea with ground because we're going to show them that actually this burger not only is it much more sustainable and and you know the beef is ethically raised actually this burger is climate positive and we can prove that it's not only carbon neutral but it's actually carbon negative at points um whereby you know we can use these sustainable farming methods holistic farming methods like the ground the world atmosphere is um the way it is for a reason you know it's we, it's there to naturally absorb this carbon the reason it's struggling is obviously because we're just producing so much more than it can deal yeah. with but the ground itself if it's farmed in the right way we can absorb carbon that the cows produce and methane and everything obviously turns into carbon there's so much science yeah. behind it but in, i want to just try and get it across in layman terms like you know the beef production it, it is a cycle and actually yeah. it can exist completely in isolation and be have no impact on the environment yeah. whatsoever and it, and it can be part of like farming other vegetables at the same time 100 100 like, and i think that's where like we work with these farms with the ethical butcher right and they create these kind of, as I said, ecosystems where it's like, it's, there's this amazing one called Silver Pastures. And it's like, you, they plant like a hundred acres of like, I don't know, like walnut trees or something. Cause walnut is a wood that we can use and it has like a high like resale value. And then the and then they have cows in there just like freely roaming around there and pigs and chickens and how it all works is all the different animals eat all the different other parts of the, bugs yeah. and then the manure goes down and like the pigs eat the walnuts and then it's like this whole tiny cute little like little 100 acre ecosystem i think it's amazing and that actually then you get chicken eggs pork beef and then the walnut trees at the end obviously like 100 years later when they're nice and big but it's just so interesting and like i feel like we just don't have enough of this kind of education surrounding 
um, regenerative agriculture. Yeah. If people wanted to learn more about that, like where where did you kind of start? Um, well, this is the thing. Like, it's this is where it becomes hard because it's not readily. You can Google it, of course, and there's like Facebook groups and stuff of like yeah. you know crazy crusty hippies saying all sorts <laughs> of things. But yeah, it's it's it is hard to find. Um, I get my information from Farshad and Glenn, who run the Ethical Butcher, and they just happen to be like super educated on it because it's their area of expertise. But yeah. as just a normal person, I don't know where I'd go. Mm -hmm. But with what? ground our burger company we're hoping that we can start a conversation and you know get people to realize this whole process by making it a bit more fun and a bit more accessible and having it on your food shelf like this is a ground burger this is you know carbon neutral it's actually yeah. carbon negative like oh what the hell does that mean and like why and then they turn the back over and hopefully it should explain a bit more but it's hard man it's hard because you know as much as there's people like you and me and people watching this video now that might spark their interest. There's also so many people that just, they just, it's not on their radar, you know, it's, they, it doesn't bother them. Yeah. So. Well, I would definitely, I definitely, um, it's definitely something I'm interested in. I definitely recommend reading a book that kind of opened my eyes up a bit more, which is called yeah. the, Third, the Third Plate by Dan Barber. Yeah. Um, I actually have a great book. Hang on. I'm just going to grab it. Okay. Ooh. Well, Whilst Lily goes and finds that book, I think it's a great little segue to um, our next guest. Um, this so, one, this is a good book. Okay, do you want to put it a bit close to the screen? Oh, hang Me. yeah, can you see? Me, a benign extravagance. Okay, cool. Well, great. It's People cool. Can it just talks about a bit more how, like, you know, obviously vegan trends are massive at the moment and that's amazing but actually what i think we should try and work towards more is you know being able to have these two things that go together and you can still eat meat but maybe you have it once a week and it costs a little yeah. bit more money is that is that kind of met like mindset right. which okay. i think we should all push for Sorry, and that is, that is a per <laughs> that's a perfect segue to our next guest so thank you very much lily for talking to us Bye. <laughs> and uh, if anyone wants to support Lily and her business steakhouse, they can go to curbfood.store or order you through Deliveroo. Is that right? Yeah, I'm on Deliveroo, chugging away, selling steaks. Uh, obviously, within that, I think it's like 3.5 kilometer radius. So. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Okay. So um, uh, on to our next guest, we have Amelia um, from Food Chain. So we were talking a little bit about all the different, um, oh, I think, I think uh, Ollie might have gone, so I'm just going to move the screen. <laughs> so, bye, Lily. <laughs> bye, guys. Thanks. Okay, so Ollie's internet's gone down, but luckily I've learned how to use this software. So, perfect. We're okay. So, I'm going to bring in our next guest, um, Amelia. Hey. Hi, Amelia. How are you? Yeah, good. Good, thanks. Good. Um, so, uh, yeah, w Lily started talking about, you know, regenerative agriculture and uh, being able to kind of have like a wider diversity of products. And um, that's quite a nice segue into what Food Chain does and is. So for anyone who's watching but's not heard of you before, could you explain um, what Food Chain is and how you kind of help link suppliers and restaurants together? Of course. So um, kind of in a broader sense, what we're what we're trying to do is decentralize the food system. So the current food system is dominated by a few large corporates who have huge control over what food we have access to, which suppliers um, we can all we can get food from, but also the transparency in the food system. So at the moment that's large wholesalers and supermarkets. So as a consumer or as a you know small business, it's really challenging to A discover amazing suppliers doing awesome stuff be the kind of the extra effort you have to put in to work with these guys you know you've got to if you want to work with um duchess oil who are making amazing cold pressed rapeseed oil you're going to have to have another point of ordering another invoice to pay you've got to discover them in the first place and it's far easier to like lily said just buy something from booker because you know you already have a booker's account so yeah. what we're trying to do is bridge that gap and um essentially create a platform whereby you can as a trader download the app and suddenly you can connect with you know up to 90 suppliers from 
uh, a really high quality butcher such as H.G. Walter, who can deliver to you next day within London, to a tiny little farm in Devon who's specialising in slowly reared Peking ducks. So we want to make it as easy as possible for you, for traders, chefs and restaurants to find sustainable supply, but also build relationships with them and, and making it just a lot easier. Yeah. And I think like a lot of the time when we talk to people start, starting their um, own businesses, they're trying to think of ways to stand out and be different. And it's like, oh, you want to start a burger business or you want to start a steak and chips business or a fish and chips business or a car. And it's like, well, you know, those kind of things exist already by so many people. What what's going to help you stand out? And yes, things like branding and marketing can stand out, but also the quality of your produce and championing those smaller, smaller producers can really help you kind of stand out. Yeah, and I think actually in street food, you almost have more of an opportunity because you're dealing with a limited menu. You know, the ingredients you use are really being heroed in a way which restaurants can do, but in a limited sense because they're having to change their menus and, you know, they've got far more ingredients involved. Whereas when you've got a simple menu, you can really let the produce speak and because you've also got an interaction often with your customer, you know, the chef is often speaking to the customer that you're dealing with yeah you've got an opportunity to really educate them on you know what is important to you and your supply you know the relationship you have with that supplier and and really bring it into the kind of brand as a whole yeah and the, the street food offers a good opportunity to have kind of very direct face-to-face -face interaction with customers and so being able to talk about like all oh, these amazing vegetables are from here or this meat is from here it really gives this kind of uh ideas of like authenticity and trust which not only do i've seen like customers really care about now but also in terms of street food there's this kind of, uh, you know, misunderstanding and this kind of idea that it's maybe not as uh, hy hygienic or people don't care about its quality as much. Um, but I think that's changing. Like m over the last 10 years, like people really deeply care. And sometimes to the point that they don't even tell people about it. They just do it for themselves. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, like, what's it like for your suppliers and your restaurants now? Obviously, they're struggling to trade. They probably can't open. Um, what, what's it like for them? And, and how? what are they doing to kind of pivot and, and change, try and survive? Yeah, well, I mean, it's really tough uh, in both respects. I think restaurants, no one really knows what's going to happen uh it's it's really a lot of them are kind of pivoting in their own way to supply households um and then when it comes to suppliers you know often they're facing a huge amount of debt including including ourselves you know a lot of restaurants owe us money and they can't earn money to pay back yeah. the outstanding invoices um so there's a lot of debt and i think a lot of people are scared about that but at the same time I think there's some really exciting developments and, um, you know, first of all, in terms of proving the resilience of a decentralized food system, which is what Food Chain are, you know, we were really quickly able to switch and just help our suppliers service a whole new network of um, customers, which is households. Yeah. And as a network, we were able to really kind of push that on further than I think we would have been able to had we just been a, a single wholesaler selling one product. Um, yeah. So that's one really exciting development. And I think in, then the other exciting development, um, which, you know, there was an article in The Guardian um, maybe about a week ago by uh, Jonathan Nunn. And right. he spoke about how this is going to be, you know, beneficial to the hospitality industry um, for a number of reasons. You know, not only are, you know, landlords going to have to rethink you know these crazy rents um which are charged and mm -hmm. hopefully that would drop down to you know the rents that you know mar market spaces have to charge curb and things like that people are going to also have to rethink um you know they're getting an education around both cooking and they're a lot in a lot of cases they're also buying amazing restaurant quality ingredients and yeah. then through doing that they're able to actually these foods do have a cost and they have a value associated to the quality that they represent. There's a reason why when you go for, out for a meal, it tastes so much better than what you make at home. It's often because of the ingredients. So I think that actually it's an opportunity to really educate 
consumers more on having great quality produce um and hopefully that will mean it's something they're willing to pay for in the future yeah and and there's so that's the thing there's such a spectrum that because because restaurants can't access that food so many suppliers have tried to diversify and people have been able to get cuts and ingredients that maybe they never would have thought of but now when hopefully a new normal exists they might actually open up a, a brand new revenue stream for them and if you're in the throes of like creating a new business you have an opportunity to try all of these ingredients in a kind of more domestic consumer way rather than having to spend 200 pounds on something you can spend much less get a really high quality ingredient and it's not as much of a risk yeah exactly exactly i think it's really exciting for the for that reason i think it's a real yeah opportunity it's just almost like a creative destruction, kind of like there are really bad things happening, but there's also lots of really good opportunities um, to come from it. So, um, yeah, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to ask you, do you have like kind of one piece of advice for people when they're looking for suppliers to work with, whether it's through food chain or through anything? Yeah. So for me, I think, and particularly from a street food angle, I know that you like as a street food business, you generally feel like you need to be really price competitive. And in lots of ways you do, you know, if you're dealing with lunchtime trade, you're having to um, kind of compete with, you know, huge mass corporations who can cut things, cut prices down for a meal deal and things like that. I think so. I think sometimes sustainability can seem really out of touch in terms of your priorities because ultimately you're trying to make money, um, which is, you know, as we discussed earlier, you know, you need to be a profitable business before you can make any impact. So, in my view, I think that um, the most amazing way small businesses and, you know, margin type businesses, those that want to serve something at good value, is actually to think differently about not just the sources of produce, but also the produce that you're getting so for example if you're working directly with a um for example an asparagus farm which you can on the food chain app through having that direct relationship you can work out that actually they have wonky asparagus and so rather than having an asparagus dish which is completely out of your customer's price range you can do one Key asparagus, which is a third of the price and actually in your um, customer's price range. So there's products like that. There's lots of um, products which aren't expensive, but have a sustainable story. And I feel like as street food traders, you can really use your kind of your shop front, your connection with your customer customer, which you have through, you know, direct conversations as an opportunity to educate them about these ingredients um you know we spent hens hens which have been laying eggs and you know treated beautifully but then because they're layers they just get slaughtered and sometimes incinerated even though it's amazing chicken they've had a maybe they're organic but because there's no market for them whereas a street food stall that's starting out could create a market for them and actually create a story behind that underused product and yeah. still serve it value. you uh, that's so that's so yeah that's really amazing uh, it makes me think of like cabrito and um uh like using male goats and that kind of like a whole hundred you know business high, catering for high end restaurants comes from a product that people would have just killed there and then on the spot and uh, that is that kind of creativity that uh people can access and right now through these suppliers kind of having to diversify so thanks for joining us that's that's um yeah hopefully anyone who's watching i would definitely recommend downloading food chain um and accessing a lots of the great suppliers on there awesome thanks thank you very much um so uh so we've we've gone from a street food trader then we've gone to uh, a supplier or kind of connecting restaurants and we, we're going to end with uh seven dials market so that's curbs food hall in covent garden obviously we're close to the mar at the moment but we're going to talk with the gm general manager of seven dials market and that's hannah walton how are you i'm good thank you jack how are you I'm great. I'm great. I'm going to tag team my co-host, Ollie, um, okay. fellow Curb employee, because he he jumped at the chance to interview you. So <laughs> I'm going I'm to let him, um, you know, give give the sustainability questions and go for it.
Thanks. I very, I very rarely get to talk to Hannah, so this is a, an amazing opportunity for me. Isn't it? Well, I thought actually the interesting thing was that we've been through a lot of the sustainability questions for Curb and Seven Dials together. Because we kind of like a few years ago started up this idea that we wanted to look at all the practices that Curb does and how sustain how we can make it more sustainable. So we went on this insane journey. We went to conferences, we went to a MRF in East London to look at how they do, do with it and uh, tried to work out what the best solution was for Curb. And it was quite tough. It was very tough, but interesting, very interesting process. Yeah. So um, if you're a new business and you're sort of looking at how you want to put the most sustainable practices you can into into your, uh, your, your business, you want to kind of look, go back to what people have been talking about for ages, which is the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse and recycle. Yes. And I think what we discovered was those principles are literally what you should be looking at first, not the other way around. Because everyone yeah. goes like, oh, how can I, how can I recycle what waste I'm creating rather than reduce it? Yeah. So. And um, I think, yeah, go on, sorry. No, 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 you go, you go. Well, I think um, sort of listening to Lily, especially, um, one of the things that we've really realized in the process is you can't, you can't be perfect. You can't tick every single box. And actually, there's no point in doing that. Um, it's a lot better to look at it holistically. She's right in that, you know, um, she's really, you know, the detail, the main, pro her main product, the beef, is she's looking at, at that part of it and making sure that it's coming from the best possible source and hopefully educating some people along the way. So really use whatever blue roll you'd like to use because you know if you, because if you look at it you know that's what we've always got to holistically looking at every part of it you have to choose some wins you, and and also it's ever evolving always changing it's really hard to kind of ensure that you're complete you know being sustainable in every single um aspect of your business or practices or anything like that you know and well, every little even, bit you know is useful even so when we were looking at even when we were looking at it, we went through a period where we thought compostable plastics was the direction that we should be going and then totally changed that plan six months down the line because we realised that nothing gets composted. Yeah. And it's actually really hard. Yeah. I think the really interesting thing is that you need a financial incentive for pretty much any bit of this pathway to actually work. Like yeah. what Lily said, you have to have that business first before you go to actually making it as sustainable as possible. Because if people aren't being paid to do it, they just won't do it unless the government puts in proper subsidies for it. Yeah. yeah. So um, tell us about Seven Dials Market. What are some of the initiatives that you put in while well, you're part of at Seven Dials to make sure that we're trying to do sustainability right there? Um, so in the pro our process of learning all these uh, um, over these past couple of years and also the position that Curb and Seven Dials holds with the traders, the biggest impact that we can have and um, help uh, is how we deal with waste and probably the best thing that um, Seven Dials has is a Rothenberg. Um, which is an anaerobic digester. Uh, so all of our food waste um, goes into the Rothenberg and uh, it's almost like a big stomach and it sits there for um, a period of time and then we have that, it gets collected and is um, made into biofuel. So that's probably the best thing. And actually in all of our learnings, um, the most impactful we can be is how we deal with our waste. Um, often you can kind of think oh well you know aren't we doing great because we're like you say we've got the the right packaging or whatever else but none of it means anything if you don't deal with your waste co correctly and that's something that at seven dollars we um when you're you're managing the site that's the 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 biggest impact we can have um and so yeah that's probably one of the biggest things that's that's there and most exciting 
what was quite interesting with the Rothenberg, like people who know about it are like, whoa, I can't believe you got one. Well, I showed someone from <laughs> Road Chef around 7,000. And this yeah. guy was like taking, but like doing selfies with the rock. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite um, exciting. The, the interesting thing with that though, is that there is a financial incentive for it, right? That, oh, invest absolutely. that investment in it then will pay off down the line. Hmm. And actually because it's worth doing that now because you have, you produce less waste overall. So you you're getting less pickups of, um, waste removal from the council or whoever we use, mm -hmm. but it, it, yeah, it just works. And I think that seems to me like the future of sustainability where you can have that financial incentive paired with something that's good for the environment. Mm. I, I, I totally think that one of the things we learned, the mo well, which is the most interesting is when you look at the two options, which is like, say you're running a festival and you look at, on this hand, you everyone has a recyclable, disposable cup. And on this hand, you have, everyone uses the same cup throughout the whole festival. But this one costs more. On the whole, everyone went with that before, but now people are starting to move to that because they realize that the first option of using disposables just shouldn't exist, yeah. right? It, 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 shouldn't, it shouldn't be an option. It should just be the only option is to use reusable stuff. But I think I feel that that's changing now. Definitely. And I think um, this is slightly, but one of the other things that, you know, um, they, they I thought of earlier whilst the other two were talking were that the, this process um, or the, the fact that we're having to, you know, like we were saying, it's because you have to wait so long now to get some of the things that you might want. You're you're starting to be way more grateful. Uh, and you know, actually, say, for example, with like what Lily's saying and like meat consumption, perhaps where we'll move to is actually the, the gratitude of, you know, being able to access such wonderful meat that, say, for example, Lily provides means that people were, you know, it won't be that kind of like, oh, we just have the throwaway things. There's there's more thought to everything, you know, and that perhaps it will be that people are, you know, having their meat once a week, but only, at, I don't know, seven dollars market. <laughs> I think I, I, I totally think that's true. Like I'm craving, like a, a high end burger from like Truffle or something like that. Yeah. And that and that because I'm just mainly cooking veg at home. Um. So when when you try when you think you of like a a sustainability initiative that you want to push, say it's like our packed lunch campaign. Mm -hmm. What do you find? Is it nice. is it finances that are the main pushback? Or is it trying to convince people to get on board about that this is actually an important, like an important pro uh, project to be part of? What do you think? Um, uh, what do you think is holding people back the most? I would say financial, and I think even coming back um, into you know when we come back into whatever this sort of new normal is, um, financial will be really you know the key one of the key uh, players in, in, in everything in getting up, back up and running again. Um, you'll, you know, that those, before, that has always been the kind of the issue. Um, but then also there is some element that I would say um, getting people's buy-in beyond it just being a bit of a, Oh, isn't it nice for a while? You know, like there's a bit of an excitement around. Pat lunch was exciting for a bit. I do think that, you know, within our sort of circle, people have kind of held on to it slightly. But um, you need, I think you that... need serious buying. And, and, and one of the things that I'd say, sorry to keep going back to it, but, you know, the, the process of understanding how a delivery gets to you has suddenly got into people's mindsets. That yeah. hopefully yeah, that sort of stuff. That's when you get people's buy-in because they suddenly feel connected to a process. And I think you know, at lunch, um, I don't know how. I think I think there's an amazing. I think there's an amazing opportunity in the same way that people are calling for like fairer pay for workers or or like higher taxes on wealthy individuals or stuff like that. When you're looking at equality, I think sustainability should be 
part of that conversation as well. And when people are like, I don't want to go back to the old world where everyone was like in a re- living in a really unequal society, I think sustainability could be on that same like trajectory yeah. with equality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I think there's a, I think it's a positive future, but I just hope people care about it as much as uh, we do. Yeah, I think I think so. I think so. And I think, um, you know, in terms of it's not just new businesses, it's like, you know, everyone can start to think about their practices. This is a moment if you have got the um, uh, if you have got the capabilities to sort of stop and have a think, you know, it doesn't have to be new people coming in thinking about their suppliers and their practices and things like that. You know, we've got a real opportunity to just take heed for a moment and decide, you know, the stuff that is important if you can put certain things in place, even like we were saying, just one thing, uh, you change one practice, you know, it means something yeah. and it it makes a difference. Cool. Well, thank you, Hannah. Thanks. I'm going to bring Jack back in now to round off the show. Great. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think it can be quite overwhelming for people when thinking about sustainability in any business. And that kind of advice of you don't have to beat yourself up, just choose one, choose a couple things that are really important to you and and focused on them. And in time, that can give you the opportunity to go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Absolutely. And I think often what can happen is people, sorry, people can get, um, you know, sort of blindsided in the kind of trying to be really sustainable and if you dare to say that you're doing one sustainable act then somebody just you know often people just come at you to sort of be like well what about this or what about that you know but actually just one thing is great whatever it is it's don't it let makes a difference the enemy of good right exactly Ollie. Yeah. great <laughs> well, that's a, that seems like a great place to end on so thank you very much hannah for joining us as well as um amelia from food chain and lily from steakhouse um yeah i think it's it's so nice that we're all kind of looking at sustainability in kind of different ways but holistic ways like and just doing one little thing good rather than perfect can have that kind of knock-on effect um like playing a drum kit the whole time basically <laughs> yeah i agree yeah definitely okay um, well thank you thank you so much for joining us everyone um and uh yeah if anyone has any questions about sustainability um feel free to message um e- us on on the channel with uh, your comments uh, you can also message food chain or S- lily from steakhouse um, i'm sure she'd talk to you about sustainable beef cuts i think she's doing some educational videos as well anyway if you want to support lily or any of our traders uh you can go to curbfood.store um which is uh just above here yeah there is and um and yeah we'll stick some links in the description for everyone who's spoken today um All of this week, we're doing slightly different shows. Um, And tomorrow, we're going to be returning to our Curb Bootcamp. So get your DMs on. um, And we're going to be talking to another consultation challenge winner um, and talking about their business, what inspired them, what they're struggling with, what's going to help take them to the next level. So I'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And have a great day. Bye.